Welcome back to Plague Size Studios, everybody. Ryan here with something a little more instrumentally focused than usual. As today, I'm gonna be talking about my approach to the eight string guitar. And not too long ago, I talked about not only this instrument, but some of the other workhorses when it comes to Plague Scythe Studios as a channel. But when it comes to my own music, I've pretty much exclusively relied on eight stringed instruments for the guitars as of yet. And indeed, after just recently releasing yet another eight string guitar centric EP, I thought I would take the opportunity to talk about some of the things that are not as gear related and more related to songwriting or the technical setup of these instruments to make them kind of a catalyst to create new music for me and hopefully give you a little bit of insight into things that helped me out over the years, things and tricks I use to cultivate new sounds. And hopefully by the end, we'll be able to create some music that doesn't completely rip off Meshuggah's Catch 33. Throughout this video, we'll be covering a few topics. First of all, I'll kind of go over a, a high level view of some of the gear that I tend to use with eight string guitars. If you've watched the channel before, you probably have a pretty good idea on most of this, but if you're brand new to the channel or brand new to this instrument, I'll try to give you some pointers and kind of general directions to take if you're trying to get the most out of this and start at a place that makes sense for the entire range of this extended range instrument. Then I'll go into kind of the guitar setup itself, what I tend to favor in terms of scale length, pickup configuration, the types of picks and strings I like. And then finally, we'll go into some more music theory, technical songwriting stuff that I catch myself uh, performing many times across all the music that I've released and am continuing to work on towards future releases. So again, hopefully this is gonna be somewhat valuable to you guys. And if not, here is a brief, somewhat brief at least, a psychological evaluation as to why my music sounds the way that it does. So let's kick it off with some of our gear selection. As many of you will probably already know, I don't really care if it's digital or analog or VST plug-in or a tube or solid state thing or a floorboard modeler. If it sounds good, there's a good chance I'm going to like something about it. And really the workflow and the models available or whatever I have that's real in front of me, should I be craving that workflow, uh, that's kind of going to determine what I use at the moment. For the initial CDRM EP, I used, you know, the Fractal Audio AX8 exclusively. It did everything I wanted it to do. For this last EP under Elatria, I used real tube amplifier heads, three of them, in fact. Uh, one solid state hybrid amp for the bass guitar tones. I used real pedals. I used cabinet impulse responses, though, for the cab sounds. But all of these things represent a real life counterpart if I did not use that real life thing. And you can use this philosophy with anything, whether it's VST plugins or a floorboard, you know, digital amp modeler or what have you. I think my number one advice would be if you're going to explore eight string guitars as a new player or, you know, say you're comfortable with the six string, maybe even comfortable with the seven string, you're moving on to an eight string, don't change up your rig just yet. Um, if you have something that is capable of getting good sounds out of that, there's probably a good chance it's going to be able to get a good eight string sound with just a little bit of modification. So especially if you have a Line 6 Helix or if you have a 5150 tube head, you could probably just throw a boost up in front, carve out some of the frequencies I'll talk about later, and you'll be able to get a good sound to start with, to learn with, and to write with. So number one piece of advice for the gear is don't think of this as an entirely different instrument. There are things you need to do to compensate for it and get the best out of it. But generally, if your gear can get a good seven string or down tuned six string sound out of it, it's probably a pretty good contender for an eight string guitar. Speaking in broad terms, I would kind of divvy up guitar tones among a handful of categories. You have your really clean, clean stuff, edge of breakup where it's sort of clean, not quite crunch, but you know, the more you dig into your pick, you get just a little bit of saturation. You have full blown kind of crunch mid gain tones. You have your heavy rhythm tones, which is what a lot of down tuned and seven and eight string, even nine string guitar stuff is known for. And then for me, you kind of have like this liquid sounding lead or indeed that could be a more boosted, more mid-focused version of your rhythm sound as well. But those are kind of the, the categories of guitar that I generally tend to play. 
And when it comes to some of them, you don't really have to change anything in my experience to get what you want out of it because most of the time you're not playing these bottom two strings anyway. For instance, on the lead sound, I like a good overboosted rectifier or Mesa Mark series sound and, you know, kind of crank the mids and even sometimes a two by 12 or one by 12 cabinet to accompany it and throw some, you know, washy delay and reverb stuff. And, and I'm pretty much at home. That doesn't really change regardless of if it's a six string, hell, it could be a six string with the bottom two strings broken because that's mostly what my leads are doing. I do take advantage of a couple of these strings here on the last EP for uh, lead purposes, but mostly you're in a, a register, you're playing in octaves that you would be playing on a six string anyway, and you don't have to really do anything with that. So if you got a good lead sound and you can switch to it, probably don't need to change much of anything with that, maybe a noise gate setting. For the cleaner stuff, if you don't plan on using these baritone notes a whole lot, you might not have to change anything and it'll do exactly what you want, you know, depending whether or not you have the pickup configuration that you're used to. I find the more you start integrating some of these low notes though, the more I tend to need compression or some sort of saturation in front of the amplifier to kind of mellow out the difference in volume because sometimes it can be you know more quiet or a lot louder than the treble notes depending on how you're playing each one of them. So I tend to like to have something like uh, the Bogner Harlow engaged for that stuff, which is more transformer saturation. And I, I, I will probably mention this a couple times, but I very much prefer that sound over a squashed compression sound, though there's a time and place for that as well. And it really depends on, again, how much you're favoring that, how hard you're uh, picking these, or if you're finger picking and just doing kind of a light, you know, bass thumb thing, then you might be able to make them blend really well without much compression at all. But that's the number one thing I tend to find myself changing going from a six string to a seven or eight string application is just a touch more dynamic range reduction somewhere in the signal chain. And oftentimes I find it sounds best before the amplifier. When it comes to edge of breakup and even crunch stuff, Sometimes you won't even be playing in the lower register and you won't have to change anything at all. Other times when you start getting into, let's say a fatter lead tone, or you want to start throwing some thumpy stuff in there, uh, which oftentimes does sound really cool on you know more breakup and, and into mid gain crunch sounds, that's when I find you have to start kind of managing the low end frequencies of this. And sometimes it can sound great wide open. It totally depends on the guitar and what you want to hear, what amp platform you're playing through. But if you're in front of like a, you know, a crunchy JCM 800 or Friedman style channel, you might want to back off on the bass a little bit. So that's where something like a graphic EQ up in front or any type of, you know, boost pedal that gives you treble and bass ranges to play with will come in handy. And as you'll see, it's a common theme with all of these sounds is that the bass management is very important. All those bass frequencies going into an amplifier or into the signal chain downstream because a lot of this stuff simply wasn't designed for this, right? It was designed for the more uh, mid-focused frequency ranges of a six string. So it totally makes sense. Then you start getting into you know your heavier high gain stuff and that's where people oftentimes really you know, get focused in on their sound because that's what's playing most of the time for heavy metal music. And indeed, this is where you can take stuff like, it, you know, your more traditional rectifiers, 5150s, hot rotted plexis, and boost them and back off on those offending bass frequencies. And again, this is a, a, a bit of a touchy subject because a lot of people hate what stuff like the TC Electronic Integrated Preamp does when you completely nuke the bass. Other people uh, can't stand any shred of bass and will daisy chain multiple, you know, tube screamers or graphic EQs, you know, stuff just to get it exactly the way they want. But it ultimately comes down to your ears. What I prefer is to have, you know, a tighter bass response and leave as much of the mids and treble there as possible. Obviously, not every amp's gonna play great with that, but, you know, I, I like a lot of that natural high end, so I don't tend to prefer the tube screamer hump unless my amplifier is making up for those frequencies elsewhere, like if there's a bright cap or something. So, again, it's gonna really depend, but if you're happy with your six string sound or even seven string sound, generally you can just take that and tweak it ever so slightly, maybe involve one more passive EQ and you'll take out some of the flubby, not so nice frequencies out of the low end and, and find a place where it slots in because that's kind of what you want it to do. You definitely don't want the lowest two strings to sound like thin spaghetti, right? But 
you want some level of tightness, clarity, articulation uh, while retaining the fundamental and, and being able to, you know, kind of meld with a bass guitar to create this super powerful low octave effect. At least that's kind of what I go for. As for the configuration of the guitar itself, unfortunately you can't just buy this one off the shelf as this is a custom job, but there are aspects of this that I highly recommend and something that I'm uh, pretty particular about when it comes to eight strings specifically. For six and even seven string guitars, a lot of the times, the standard Fender scale length, you know, down to a Gibson scale length, depending on the application, I have no qualms about. For an eight string though, when you start getting into these lower tunings and fatter strings, I get really irritated at the, the way that a lot of these manufacturers are specking their instruments to the point that I think many of them up until only the past few years have been a complete waste of resources because they completely miss the point oftentimes of extended range guitars. So the number one most important thing for me, scale length. Like I said, most of the time, a normal scaling is gonna work just fine for even down-tuned six and seven string instruments, and there is a different tone associated with that. I do like a, a fat baritone, you know, B sound on even a Gibson scale length guitar. There, there's something chewy and mushy about it that kind of works for some genres. For this, if you're playing an eight string, I want a more precise, uh, tighter sound, something that doesn't sound like a bridge cable flopping when you hit the low F sharp or F string. And to achieve that, I find that a you know, 27 and a half, 28 inch plus scale length with some 70-ish gauge strings down here is the ticket. I actually have a 28 and 5 8 inch guitar uh, besides this 28 inch scale length instrument here and there is something to be said about how well those low two strings play for that. Um, but I wanted something that was just a little bit shorter, a little bit more manageable, especially in the high end. And so I settled for 28 on this one, and it was still a great call. It feels great, and it is vastly superior to a 25 and a half inch scale length because I, I have one and, and I know. But a lot of people will say, well, you know, I don't like feeling like I'm playing uh, this boat, you know, this. Uh, jet liner landing strip of an instrument, and that sentiment has no doubt spurned the development of a lot of these multi-scale instruments out on the market today. It's something that was a lot harder to come by just a handful of years ago, but it's something that tries to you know solve both problems. Where yeah, down here you get a ton 
of tension and the string feels better, but up here, it's a lot easier to play because it feels more like a standard scale length guitar because effectively it is, you know, down here on the treble strings, it's closer to a Fender scale length, or maybe it even is that 25 and a half you know, kind of region, and then up on the baritone strings, they're a bit more of, you know, those extended 27 and a half, 28 inch scale lanes, depending on how crazy you want to get and how much money you want to spend, you can find different variations of those, shall we call it, pitches of uh, fanned fret designs. Now, what you end up finding a lot of the times, if you're going to be shopping in that sub $1,000 range though, is just a fixed scale length and most of the time they're not long enough, quite frankly. Just like this LTD H338, which sports a standard fender scale length neck and it's all right. It plays just fine on you know the, the typical six string stuff and the weird kind of mismatch between scale length and the tuning of the instrument actually kind of gave me the idea to play this in an alternate tuning because at least I was able to take advantage of the short scale. So instead of playing this in you know a standard F or F sharp, I'm playing this in an open B flat uh, with a high F here and a low F here. So that gave me a lot of you know neat musical ideas that I wouldn't have had otherwise. But what ends up happening on a scale length like this is you have to increase the diameter of the lower string so much to make the tension feel right, at least, you know, right for me. And this is going to change person by person, of course. But you get to this point where it feels like you're playing a, a, a dead bass string, like, a, a again, a bridge cable, where there's like no tone, at least the way I, that I play, I just get this dead do, 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 that just sounds like they're, they're you know, two-year-old strings on a guitar. Whereas on the Longer scale length, you know, smaller, let's say 70 gauge diameter, I get much more of the down, you know, the, the genty attack that you want out of these kinds of instruments, at least that, that's what I want. So it's going to come down to personal preference, but that's why I will always ditch something like this in favor of um, something that has, a, you know, a longer scale length. Additionally, there will be other options that will come down to personal preference, like neck through versus bolt on neck, or the types of pickups or bridge configuration. For me, I like to have something that is at least fine tuning capable, which is why I got the ABM bridge on my Super Typhoon, which in and of itself is basically, you know, a, a Gibson style tailpiece and bridge, but just with fine tuning capability on it, just like some of the TP6s from Gibson. And that unfortunately necessitates some specific design changes to guitars that you might not have that option for, especially if you're buying off the shelf. But I think a good fixed bridge is where you want to be at the very least. I have an eight string with a Kaler. Uh, it it kind of sucks to set up. You know, once you get it where you want it, it's great. It holds awesome, in my opinion. I'm not doing any dive bombs on it, though, because, oh God, I can't even imagine what's going to happen when those strings come back into tension. I uh, wouldn't necessarily want to deal with much, many of like the Ibanez bridges, though I've heard, you know, mixed results on that as well. So for me, for a studio tool, my Super Typhoon does everything I want it to do. Um, if I were playing live though, and I had, you know, somebody tuning my own guitars, I would probably go with some multi-scale approximation that just has less points of tuning to make things easier on the fly and, you know, something that maybe a, a guitar tech would be more familiar with. One last word on guitar configuration with the pickup choice. As I said before, this is going to be really user specific and it's going to come down to personal preference. And a lot of the times that preference is heavily weighted by how good does the bridge pickup sound, bridge humbucker more accurately when you're doing, you know, the chugs. And most of the time, the answer is going to be really good because a lot of contemporary guitars, especially extended range guitars, are coming with Fishman Fluences installed, which is good because a lot of them have multiple voices that you can choose from. Uh, whereas something like these, you know, you got a analog push-pull pot that's doing the switching between a single coil sound, you know, split coil sound and the full-blown humbucker, and it doesn't sound as full as what the Fishmans can do with a lot of the, you know, layered technology. Some guitars still coming with stuff like Seymour Duncan Blackouts and EMGs for the traditional active pickup sound, and there's good points about all of them. Um, I like to have like kind of one of everything if possible, and uh, I very much like my Fishman Fluence, you know, kind of toasting the bossy sound out of the other eight string guitar I have. The most visceral sound to me though still comes from passive pickups, these being the Lundgren M8s. Uh, there's some great bare knuckle 
models out there and even some of the more you know affordable OEM equipped pickups sound just fine and will definitely not be a bottleneck in your sound. This through analog gear, I, I really don't want anything else. But there are certainly specific applications where if I was going for the most contemporary, most polished, radio friendly, or even like the most industrial, least amount of dynamic range thing possible, then I probably would go for a different solution. Um, I did just that on Cedrum. Children of the Stars, where I played that aforementioned H338 on like three of the songs because it had that EMG kind of compression limited thing and still sounded beefy and full without being overwhelming in any one particular frequency. And that through a really saturated high gain amp, it just, it did what I wanted it to do because I was looking for more dynamics out of the drums and the, you know, backing orchestral stuff. Whereas for Alatria, even though I did play this on a couple Seedrum songs, I wanted something that's more raw, more amp in the room kind of feel, and uh, that's what I trended towards. I just like the passives for that. So if you had to pick one, Fishman Fluences are a great thing to go for, um, but for me, just like all my instruments, I like to have one of everything if possible, but again, it's really going to come down to your preference. Are you an old school 90s death metal guy? You might like the passives better. Did you grow up with the EMG through a tube screamer boosting a 5150 sound? Then you, you might like the more active sound. To kick off the playing and the very basic music theory here, I guess I'll show you what I am physically playing. I tend to put Ernie Ball seven string super slinkies on this thing, sometimes regular slinkies depending on what mood I'm in, but I, I feel the, the nines to the 52s really does a good job on the first seven strings. And then for the last string, I get the custom 70 gauges from Ernie Ball as well, kind of, you know, same series. And I order these through strings by mail still uh, because I, I haven't really found a, a better deal and they're always quick and I can't really argue with the pricing. So uh, that's kind of my setup because I cannot find a 70 gauge set that I like. Hell, you can find 70 gauge seven strings easier than you can uh, 70 gauge eight string sets. And like I said earlier, you know, I can go up to maybe 72, sometimes 74 on a shorter scale length, but um, I, really that's more reserved for the shorter scale stuff and it, it doesn't feel good to me whatsoever. Uh, this still feels like a guitar. It, you know, still you can get, you know, kind of dig in with the pick and it has that visceral reaction. Of course, you have to set your guitar up well for it so you don't get fret buzz and it doesn't feel too loosey goosey on you. But um, that's what I like on 28 inch scale length guitars and up. I've also tried these Dunlop heavy cores. I don't like the B and the E string though, being a 60 and a 50. The 70 gauge string on this as well uh, sometimes feels a, a little cable-y and kind of has that dead, like dull sound to it that uh, sounds like an out of tune Tom <laughs> if I had to uh, you know, equate it to anything else. Worth a shot if you find them cheap, and that's kind of why I bought them. But i um, still sticking with the Ernie Ball stuff because it's what I've pretty much always played. Um, never really ventured out into any of the coding stuff on 8-string, but um, I, I like it. And that's the one downside to playing something that is this size is if you're like me and you don't find the pack of strings that that fit your needs, you're probably going to have to start parting out sets and, you know, buying individual strings here and there. It could be done. And quite frankly, I could, I could stand this B string to be a little heavier, but I'm not going to go that nuts. So um, I like it. I can play it. For the Plectrum side of things, I do actually use a Jim Dunlop product, the Prime Tones 88s. I uh, don't really like many things that are in the mill or thicker category, although I've tried, you know, some picks in the past that, that have a cool kind of texture going on, and I, I could get used to them, if nothing else, for how long they last, but um, just the, the feel of it, I'd I'd rather say to hell with it and, you know, buy a 10-pack of these every couple months, and, and that generally lasts me. The uh, Meshuggah <laughs> signature picks are awesome. I, you know, keep a few of those around as well. Definitely fun, but for my own music, uh, I use the, the Prime Tone series. And, of course, if you like a thicker or thinner pick, you'll probably be able to find something in that category. The main takeaway is whatever you are used to on a six string or a seven string guitar, you probably won't have to change hardly anything. You know, obviously you have to go up in string sizes or find the, the equivalent for the next ones you're missing. Uh, but for the pick side, if you're playing anywhere from, I would say a 0.7 on up, 
probably won't have to do a, a whole lot. You know, if you're one of those guys that likes a paper thin pick, then it's probably not going to work great on the lower strings. But if you're already the kind of, you know, chuggy digging into your strings kind of player, and those hold up fine on the seven or six string application, you're probably in the clear. Now, actually creating music on an eight string guitar. Many people will grab an extended range instrument and you know they're they're going to be tempted to do what you know so many of our forefathers in the eight string space have done before which is and that's fine the zero one chug arrhythmic thing is is cool and there's you know times and places for it hell there's um, a section on one of my most uh, newest releases that that does kind of a atonal diminished thing there's a, a place for it of course what you don't want to do is is do nothing but that you're missing the uh, kind of the, the point of the instrument as a whole but that's not to say there's absolutely no merit and the ideas that a lot of the, you know, 0101 or, you know, 013 type of riffs uh, provide because there's a couple fundamental things that a lot of them do, which is kind of this percussive chug, palm muting lift. I find, especially when you're working with multiple octaves like we often do with this instrument, uh, having a solid right hand is, is just paramount to getting interesting things down because you can play things completely open and it'll sound all right but if you throw in some you know skipped palm mutes or you only palm mute on the lower strings you can kind of make the notes shine that you want to and, and one example i'll show you with a kind of a diminished scale is uh the intro riff and the, the next verse of under the scythe on this latest calamitous constructs ep which the first time i play completely open which is like this <laughs> And then the next one, I play palm muted, which kind of gives you this dynamic punch when the non-palm muted notes come in. And for me, that palm muted part is just so much more dynamic and it highlights the melody, so to speak, that I, I want people to hear that underneath all those jumbles of notes, there's kind of this high, you know, higher note line that's going on that uh, you can kind of digest a little bit easier. Whereas the first part where every note is kind of at the same level of dynamics, it's just meant to overwhelm you and, and you just hear this chaos and everything else going on where it kind of resolves into something a little more, again, digestible. And there's, again, merits to both things. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But either way, uh, being able to alternate palm mutes and string skip in that uh, fashion is, is really important for me to get a, a cool eight string and, and, and indeed any you know lower tuned guitar sound. The other thing that I like with the, um, you know, the zero one stuff is a lot of the times it's going to rely on a screwed up rhythm to make interesting because if you're just going, going to get a little repetitive and, and kind of sound samey. But uh, for me saying, okay, I'm going to restrict myself to just two or three notes here. How can I make that interesting? Um, well, you've got you know, plenty of examples to work off from, but um, again, to, to be a self-promotion machine, kind of did a, you know, a Catch 33 ripoff thing.
And this is nothing out of the ordinary or, or new. This is, you know, simply adding dotted notes here and, uh, you know, kind of playing them in a cycle where it resolves on maybe a, an odd number of of uh, measures that you're not expecting. All those things can be used to transform what are otherwise simple sounding riffs or simple sounding single note passages uh, into something that is far more memorable and uh, complex and musically fulfilling. Because, I mean, that's what a lot of people are going to do. It, it is kind of uh, a little bit more daunting to look at this whole instrument and say, oh, I've got eight strings to work with for a chord. How am I going to work that in? So a lot of the stuff that people try out early on are those single note things because this instrument just has so much, you know, grunt, so much oomph in the lower strings that it doesn't sound stupid when you play single notes. Whereas a lot of the, you know, E flat or higher, or even D stuff, you need a full blown power chord to sound right. You know, you got your Metallica stuff. And oftentimes those things still resolve into a power chord. So you need something, some hook, some catch to make, you know, those, those things stand out a little bit more. Now, another thing that I did with that passage. is a rudimentary form of what I sometimes casually call octave hopping. I'm sure there's a far more eloquent music theory way of saying that, but ultimately you're playing different parts of a, of a harmony at different times on different registers. So, you know, these two, is just a straight octave. This though, that's, you know, a major third down here on these is actually F sharp, so I'm down, um, you know, one half step because it sounds weird to me otherwise. And then you got here another another major harmony. And you could do that all up through the strings, right? Play that entire scale if I wanted to. And you can do that on a six string as well. Most people are not gonna do that though. In a an electric guitar environment. And that's one thing that if I had to uh, really nail home here, is that there's a lot of classical and jazz components, not that I'm good at either one of them, but there's a lot of those ideas that you'll find will translate a lot better to eight string guitar than, than distorted six string guitar, oddly enough, because there is so much, you know, singular note focus. So, you know, I could have done these two here within the same octave and, and play those chords, but instead you get, and you get that, different contrast between the low note and the high note. And again, this is nothing that's mind blowing or that uh, you haven't heard a thousand times in, in extended range guitar music before, but you, I, you will notice a lot of the times that there will be this chord, this harmony that is split just one more octave apart than you might normally be used to hearing it. And you can do the opposite too, where the root of the scale is on the higher octave. Where I do that there as well. So it's just playing with those different relationships of the key that your song is in, and again, taking advantage of the fact that you have these two strings down here. And that's what I always like to think is like as a casual listener, what's happening there? There's there's really a da 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 da. But what can I do as a musician that makes sense contextually to fill in those gaps and, and especially, you know, like meld with a, a drum set there. And oftentimes you'll just find this feel, this mechanical things that your your fingers do that, that just, you know, result in that, whether you mean it to happen or not. Uh, one of the greatest examples of this octave hopping uh, is Meshuggah's Combustion. That was where I went, holy shit, these guys know what they're doing when it comes to eight string guitars. Uh, and, and it convinced me I, I needed one, of course, right after I heard that album. And it's something that uh, takes advantage of arguably up to three octaves. And it's, it's, it's pretty nuts because it's all within the same scale, but it sounds almost alien with how many notes are happening simultaneously because you're taking advantage of so many strings at the same time in a rhythmic single note application and it almost has this synth-like thing going on.
a lot of other concepts that that one riff does, and of course later in the song does as well. That kind of returns to that alternated palm muting idea. You have the relationship between the F and E flat string, you know, being kind of what completes the scale as a seventh. So hopping between those, you kind of have this resolve happening at all times going between the two. A lot of crazy ideas there that, um, again, you could do in one octave and it would sound boring as hell, more than likely, but because you're jumping the notes, and you kind of have this zigzag pattern of, of fretwork, at least that's what it looks like in my head, um, you, you have something that sounds actually more complex than music theory says it is. Let's say you wanted to integrate more of the strings at the same time, though. Uh, one thing that John Brown of Monuments does that I've picked up on a lot that <laughs> I've used on a couple of songs is, is kind of this drone string idea where you might have this chord that isn't perfectly related to the other higher notes that are being played, but especially depending on what tuning you have, you might be able to just kind of jam on those top two or three strings that works really well in open tuning. Um, but you know, even like on the, uh, the, the bridge section of Under the Scythe, I kind of do something similar. This is of course pretty context dependent because what works about this passage is that I'm going into a you know an F chord and that B flat and E I'm just completing that scale into the next F chord where and then it resolves into an F. So you can't do that all the time obviously, but it certainly helps bring some complexity and fullness to what would otherwise just be a just a chugging, you know, D flat there. And, you know, in the next passage there, I'm using the same power chord structure, but taking advantage of the fact that that is, you know, one note in a, a scale that I, I want to use anyway. So you can kind of plan tactically around these things and, and have your your hand in, in a position that you, you don't have to fret as many notes because you have more strings available to you. Again, it's going to be song dependent, it's going to be key dependent, but um, when there's an opportunity to make things more full or especially play an open string, uh, you know, I just really like that sound, I'm going to try to take it. Likewise, this in particular works nice on clean passages. You can add a low note to chords that you otherwise couldn't play the low note to. So like on Custis Ominum and uh, Cedarum, I just have this, you know, kind of open B flat major chord. Got a B right there, so you can just start on that. And then when you play, you know, a D, you can add that low D down here since you have that on a you know a third fret and it's relatively easy, easily reached. Of course, playing a you know not a true D chord there, it's an add, but nonetheless, a lot of these typical cowboy chords or some derivative thereof, you're probably in a position where you can relatively easily add on one of these, you know, root notes or even a, a harmony of that root if it sounds right. Of course, it's gonna be context dependent. One thing that really helps with that for me and some of the songs I'm developing right now is, or this has uh, the ability to you know, change tuning so quickly, is you can add, you know, down here, low E flat, or,
And essentially you've just turned the roll of this sixth string into the eighth strings roll, where now you don't really need a bass guitar back there, especially if you have your you know, amplifier EQ to where there's enough low end coming in on the clean sound. And again, I find this works quite a bit better on cleaner passages if you're gonna do you know sustained notes like that, but not always, because I'm actually doing just that on the introduction to Plague Doctor, where it's essentially this chord. And I'm just adding that low D flat there. So if you have a chord or a, a passage of notes that you want sustained, do you want it to, to sound full, try to think of ways that you can incorporate the root of that, you know, that scale on a lower string, whether it be the seventh or, or eighth. And sometimes it's, it's simply not going to happen, but if, especially if you're in a two guitar setup, there's more possibilities there to kind of split it, especially in a studio environment where, you know, you can kind of record as many layers as you want. But uh, especially if you're playing out, you can you can do a lot of cool things over there where, you know, maybe someone's playing the, the harmony down here or just doing some a rhythmic thing and uh, the other person can, can play more traditional chords over top of it. And it's just another piece of the puzzle you can use to fill in between a bass guitar and a, a standard guitar range. And if all else fails, nothing else is working for you, you can always try some different types of tuning modes. And of course, you're not gonna be able to do this fully open thing on a 28 inch scale guitar without some crazy string gauges, but there are different variations you can try of, you know, drop here or tuning this one up, tuning this one down. Um, John Brown, like I mentioned before, does some crazy B, almost open, not quite open tunings. Devin Townsend, which, uh, you know, I, I used <laughs> as my reference for this tuning. It's actually that plus an F. Well, it's that tuned down, you know, a whole step plus an F plus, you know, uh, the string ultimately. But, you can try these different things to maybe cultivate chords that you otherwise can't achieve easily. You know, adding stuff like that is, is just absolutely cake. And for me, open tuning, especially in a major scale, makes me want to play stuff in a major or mixolydian type of mode. But, um, you know, within just a few days of screwing around, with this guitar and this tuning, I wrote 90% of Absolution, which is the last song on uh, Children of the Stars, where, uh, you know, kind of employ all those tricks, but you can do different modes and, and you can reach frets more quickly that you otherwise couldn't and, and get these, you know, kind of arpeggiated lines um, that is only possible with open tuning. <laughs> And those things kind of combine all of those octave hopping and, and palm muting alternations that we spoke about earlier. So, you know, there's no reason you absolutely have to stick to a, a standard tuning. Um, hell, I, I played kind of this 
uh, it's not true double drop because you're really dropping two separate strings, but um, whereas most of the last EP was all written in, in F standard, I actually dropped the B flat string down to A flat, so you know, kind of like a, a drop seven string tuning, and then the F string down to E flat. So those two strings still had the same relationship to one another as a normal you know E and A string would, uh, and then it happens again. So you kind of play this like spider type <laughs> arrangement to make a full you know, four note power chord, or you have these really cool relationships in, in, in how, you know, easy it is to uh, get a, you know, a, an accidental in there, or being able to quickly switch between the major and minor, you know, add third on that higher string because it's, you know, it's the same note, it's just a different octave, and therefore all the relationships are a little bit closer together than they otherwise would have been normally. Uh, and then, of course, you know, that throws a wrench into, uh, well, down here you're playing this open, down here you have to kind of chord it. Uh, so there's some interesting alternations between bar cording if you're going for the chugs versus, you know, single note stuff. And then you got the relationship with the these two strings being open again when you get to that point. Opens the door for, for a lot more possibilities that I feel haven't been explored fully um, in those octaves uh, versus, you know, the standard tuning because um, you can just kind of alternate between the two and you were always, if you're, you know, hammering on and pulling off, you're always resolving on that E flat or E or whatever your, your open tuning is. And the same can be said for drop tuned A flat on a seven string or whatever you're, you're playing in key wise. <laughs> If you put all that stuff together, a lot of these things are not exclusive to an extended range guitar, for sure. But a lot of those things become much more natural feeling and the lower tunings are better at it, especially those single notes, the addition of higher strings. It just, there's a level of contrast and punch there that I just don't feel the same connection to with a six string guitar. When, when I write music on a six string, uh, most of the time, it, it comes out sounding like uh, you know Black Label Society <laughs> or uh, something more dad rocky because that's what that instrument does for me. Whereas this, there's just there's a there's a lot more depth to it, and I'm certainly barely scratching the surface of it. But all that said, hopefully there was some nugget of information in here that uh, will help you maybe be more comfortable with this type of instrument with lower tunings with more strings. And if nothing else, you can kind of see my mindset as to, to how I've arrived at the music that I have. So thank you so very much for watching. Please let me know if you have any other tips or tricks to add. Any other questions, leave them below. I'll try to get to them, and we will see you next time. Bye.